You're listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast, Episode 20. The Aikido culture, I think, and perspective is definitely changing, I think. In the mainstream conventional sense, I would say that for my own part, uh, it's, it's getting a little bit further away from the message than I would like to see it. I guess I'm a purist in that way, and um, I, I keep myself, for my own part, very, very close to um, the founders expressed ideal that I and the universe are one. And that's the basis for my work. You're listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast. Life Purpose, spirituality, higher calling, personal growth, meaningful life. We ask the deep questions about living a balanced life of meaning, purpose, and joy. Passion, know thyself, be mindful, spiritual practice, aha moments, life lessons, balance. It is time to welcome your host, Angie Swartz. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dave Goldberg to the show. Dave is an Aikido Godan and founder of Aikido San Diego. He teaches, practices, and embodies Aikido. Hello, Dave. Welcome to the show. Hi, Angie. It's very good to have you. Thanks. Good to be here. I know there's a, a lot more to know about you. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, Aikido is uh, mostly the center of my life, certainly professionally. You know, my direction in life, my life's work. Uh, I've been doing this now professionally for about 15 years and uh, it continues to evolve for me all the time. And I'm just now in my latest iteration of you know, what it means to embody Aikido, which is my primary objective and then to uh, of course you know help other people do that i also have twin boys which are the other you know a major part of my life i'd say that's enough <laughs> it's enough for day-to-day life no plenty plenty for for those listening that might not be familiar with aikido can you just give a little bit of an introduction about it sure aikido um it's a martial art that's a kind of a post-war phenomenon developed by a uh a man named Morihei Ueshiba. It was also an evolution for him. He started developing it, of course, before the war. You know, as a result of the um, terrific devastation of that time, it seems that he developed Aikido as a, um, an expression of his own inspiration, which was that martial arts can be a path of unification rather than division, a path of creativity rather than destruction, path of harmony rather than um, separation. The art is based on, a, on an ongoing principle of non-resistance. So I, I studied with you a little on the mat. Mm-hmm. I like the description of Aikido being a more harmonious, free, and effective way to develop people. Mm-hmm. It's very much a practice, would you say? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, the, the art itself has an art form, which is in the, in the context of martial arts. It's absolutely a warrior way, a do, if you will, in the, in the Japanese sense of budo. But the principle reaches all aspects of life. What I do is present it in such a way that when a person leaves the training area, they're still doing Aikido. It's still accessible to them in, um, in any form of conflict and in life. Right, right. My experience was whatever was going on in my life was certainly very apparent on the mat Mm. in your dojo. Yeah, yeah. That's what I aim to do, and uh, I'm only getting um, more and more uh, in touch with that, it seems. So if you have have cloudiness in your mind or confusion or you're struggling with something emotionally or spiritually, you're going to see that same thing show up physically on the mat – and through those practices that you teach, I think that becomes more apparent to the student, and and maybe they become a little more self-aware, maybe not on all those levels, but they are certainly clear that there's something here to play with. Sure. I mean, look, there, there's always a relationship between our being and our action in life, and Aikido is, uh, is one way to not only express that, but also be informed by it. To, to be clear about it, you know, it, it attracts people um, from all walks of life um, because it's, um, it's so inclusive in that manner. It's, it's not just, you know, a, a, you know, people who are coming to, you know, learn how to be ninjas <laughs> or 
<laughs> Although some of you are are very ninja like, very stealth. Sure, I got I got no problems with ninjas. <laughs> right, bring them on. Right. Be prepared for a perspective of it that's peaceful in nature. Right, a peaceful warrior. Yes. So you've been studying Aikido for a very long time. Uh, I started, I think, in '86. That is a while, almost 30 years. My first exposure to it was when I was 14, I believe. My cousin was doing it at uh, Tufts University, and I was still in, uh, obviously, in high school, just starting. I had uh, experiences with it here and there, but never really got full-time practice until um, until 1986, I believe. Actually, 87 was when I started really full-time practice, but I had uh, a little bit more exposure in 86. And then at some point in time, you studied in Japan. Yeah, in 1990, I went to Japan. I studied with a fair amount of the um, founder's uh, students, and I continue to do that, actually. My teacher was my uh, current teacher uh, of the last, I would say, 13, 14 years is Robert Nado, who was up in the Bay Area and was a a direct disciple of Morihei Ueshiba. Mm. So you're one step from the creator of this practice. Correct, in that sense, yes. And is are things changing as as life evolves and and we get further away from the creation of the practice? Aikido, yeah, the Aikido culture, I think, and perspective is definitely um, changing. I think, in the mainstream conventional sense, I would say that, for my own part, uh, it's it's getting a little bit further away from the message than I would like to see it. I guess I'm a purist in that way, and um, I. I keep myself, for my own part, very, very close to um, the founder's expressed ideal that I and the universe are one. And that's the basis for my work in in the context of the art, of course. Right. There's quite a spiritual nature, or at least in my view, of what happens in your dojo. I was exposed to Aikido at a conference, a Buddhist conference, Authentic Leadership in Action, Mm -hmm. and came back looking for a place that somewhat mimicked what I had been exposed to, Mm -hmm. the personal development side of Aikido. And and it seems like there are certainly dojos out there that are just or or more so just focused on the physical aspect. Yeah. But I didn't didn't find that with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's generally true that Mainstream Aikido these days is, is highly focused on technique. You know, I, I love technique. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But uh, there does come a point, I think. I'll speak personally. There came a point for me when technique was simply not enough to take me to a place where it was clear that Aikido had this to offer. Right. Because it was always clear to me that Aikido is coded in spiritual principles, even from the from just watching the technique and and the energy behind it. It was always obvious to me from the very beginning since a teenager. But, you know, that's all you're ever doing. There is not really a, a direction or encouragement or, you know, any support to um, investigate other dimensions. Then um, typically it's only going to take you so far. And I think, for my part, I'll I'll just openly say that, you know, I think I'm seeing that right now in the Aikido world. And, you know, it's it's not ideal, but um, that's as it is, and and I do what I do. Great. Aikido is a, a hard thing to understand until you're there practicing it or seeing it as a part of a community. What would you say to someone that might be curious about Aikido? And I ask this because I was someone who never thought I'd ever be interested in practicing a martial art. Mm -hmm. And there's so much richness in that experience. How do you explain this to a newbie who who might be wondering? Well, Aikido, the aim of Aikido is to really um, practice a completely different paradigm of dealing with conflict. The paradigm that you know, we're in as a as not only a um, species, it seems, and, and a culture especially, is one that is still based on meeting conflict with a certain amount of conflict. We still have very much a fighting mentality, even if we sort of deny it or do our best to work with those aspects of ourselves. It's still pretty much the way we do things as a species and as a culture. 
So when people think martial arts in the conventional sense, they'll, you know, you think of fighting, right? And you think of offense and defense, winning and losing, all those sorts of things. Aikido isn't in that paradigm, right? Aikido isn't a paradigm that views conflict as a partnership, right? Where we don't have a winner and loser or a, uh, an offense and a defense. We have what's called an uke and a nage, which is sort of like, Sort of like saying, um, you're yin and I'm yang, and that's how we're going to practice, and then we're going to take turns, and I'll be, uh, I'll be yin and you'll be yang. And in so doing, what we're doing is um, taking a conflict, and in, if you could think about it, any conflict you have, there's always somewhere, somehow, a common interest, right? We're taking a singularity of that conflict, and we're practicing two different aspects of it. Right? a receptive aspect and a more assertive aspect. In the practice itself, learning how those two come together as a single, a single movement. So, you know, in the greater sense, let me put it this way, there's a, in the Tao Te Ching is a really nice uh, a statement that goes something like this. First there's one, then there's two, then there's the 10,000 things. And the 10,000 things refers to, you know, manifestation, all the objects. that In Aikido, we can call those techniques. There's endless, endless technical outcomes, forms that can be performed doing Aikido. Right? The content of those is always yin and yang, this or that, right? Uge and nage, soft and hard, male, female, in terms of energies, qualities, things like that. And then those two come together to create some sort of uh, unification, some sort of resolution, some sort of um, oneness. So it's kind of like, you know, if you, if you looked at the practice from that perspective, it's kind of like Aikido is reversed spiritual engineering. But for my part, um, I go in both directions. I work in both directions. I work from the so-called 10,000 things direction up, and I work from the uh, oneness direction down. And that obviously requires some um, some creative license and some innovation and um, willingness to do do things a little bit differently. Mm, mm, very nice. So I could talk to you about Aikido during our whole interview, um, <laughs> but I want to ask you some questions right. about your own life. Okay. And if if you don't mind, we'll just close our conversation, at least that part of our conversation about Aikido. I think we could say to anyone that is anyone, but anyone particularly that's out there maybe struggling with relationships or struggling with parenting or struggling with their career and their coworkers. Just struggling. That <laughs> just, you know, any kind of struggle. It's Aikido is a good place to start because that struggle is always within us. Yeah, absolutely. So anybody listening that's in the San Diego area, I would encourage you to give Dave Goldberg a call and come down and check out one of his intro classes to Aikido. Your life will be changed forever. So, but Dave, I want to know the inside story about you. Can I ask you some questions? Okay, sure. So I want to know about your life purpose. Do you know what your purpose is? I'd say so. I've known a very long time what my life purpose is. It's just, you know... It's evolved. I mean, it's one iteration after another, but it's, I've always known the general direction. Um, and I'd say I'm doing it. I mean, my life purpose um, has been to – I kind of knew very early on that I was um, on a kind of a warrior lineage of some sort. It was just inside of me. As I uh, kind of evolved, I would say, it started to take on a peaceful nature. So, you know, I'm doing what I, what my purpose is. I'm, you know, my purpose is to be exploring what it means, you know, to be a warrior of a peaceful nature and to become a, um, a living, breathing expression of the art of Aikido and to, you know, help others uh, do the same and to help them forge themselves as such and to wake up literally wake up to um, you know, their own true experience. Whatever, yeah. whatever that might be. Right. Well, in the context of the art, but it, but it, um, it always um, crosses over. There's no way to avoid it. Right. We are one, one being. Can you tell me about aha moments that told you this was your path? Um, you know, there wasn't 
any one that I could sort of point to. I mean, there was that there was that moment with my cousin that introduced me to Aikido. You know, from that time, I knew that Aikido was going to be a part of this path. You know, my aha moments um, came in really um, kind of ordinary ways and often from an engaged moment, so to speak, but a moment of reflection of, of just being where something just came to me. Were there any life events that happened to you that might have pushed you in this direction? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would categorize my entire childhood up through high school as one of those events, just a, a very unsatisfying, ungratifying, unfulfilling experience. I wouldn't say my whole childhood, but, I would, you know, those teen years were extremely um, unfulfilling and ungratifying. Really uh, pushed me to, um, I would say, to follow my calling, no matter what it was. And at the time, that also included a certain amount of travel, which has since left my system. This path that I'm on, this warrior peaceful warrior path that I'm on is um, still very much alive and has been even since then. And when you were uh, your young adult life, mm -hmm. were you, were these difficult times related to your parents? Were they related to your friends? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just life in general. And, you know, I, I should add a, a lot of that angst, uh, not, I don't know if I'd call it angst or whatever it was. Look, I've been a seeker since, or at least I was, I, I, I can't call myself a seeker anymore. You can't? You can't, Dave? You can't call yourself a seeker? No. No. Your whole life is dev devoted to a, a deeper understanding of yourself, and why? Why can't you call yourself that? Well, because it's behind me now. And what you were seeking has been found? Uh, essentially, yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, what, the did, seeking, what did you the find? Seeking in my, the seeking in my life came in the form of an incessant longing a longing for something more, something better, a sense of being in the flow, a sense of just being, peace. You know, it was with me very, very strongly and, and you know, really affected me. And uh, basically, I suffered, like everyone who, who's a seeker suffers from time to time. When I woke up to the realization that... What I was seeking all along was uh, came in the same non-form or form, whatever you want to call it, as awareness itself, and it was right there in front of me. <laughs> the longing um, dropped away, pretty much, and um, um, now I sort of experience life from a completely different place. It's interesting when that restlessness leaves leaves your your being yeah i mean it wasn't you know it wasn't a big ceremonious blissful you know now life is one big orgasm kind of a thing um it was very, <laughs> it was really very ordinary and it was you know there were no celebrations it was just like oh thank goodness you know it's like dropping baggage after so long you know it's not like you go out and celebrate you're just sort of relieved in an ordinary sort of way do you remember what you were doing or what, what time and what was happening in your life? Yeah. I mean, it, it's not really important, though, I don't think. I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago. I was simply home alone on a rainy day, went through my day and just, you know, realized that it wasn't there anymore. Mm, mm, very nice. And I think it's very important for other seekers that are still out there seeking to know that your aha moment didn't happen standing on the side of the Grand Canyon or in another country or uh, it, can't, it happened in your in your daily life. It's such mythology. It's like, you know, well, this, the, this, the space in India or the Grand Canyon is, you know, somehow <laughs> more holy than the space that's right here. You know, it's, it's always right here, Angie. It's always just right here. Zero distance from you. Inside your heart. Is that what you're saying? I don't know if I'd go there. You know, the heart is good as a pointer for your orientation towards your, towards your purpose or something like that. You, you look to your heart for your sense of calling and, and, and purpose. No, no, that's okay. You were talking about that it's always right here. And I said, in your heart. And you said, I think I'd say something different. I don't know if I want to specify that it's heart. That's too small for it. Can we say it's it's always in here in our awareness? Is that yeah. 
Yeah, it's just here. It's here. Zero distance from you. It's zero right. distance. Right? You can't take a step away from it. <laughs> is there a definition for it? Awareness. Okay. The awareness Good. that is all. Conscious awareness. So since we're here, mm -hmm. what are your spiritual beliefs and do you practice a religion? Uh, no. No, I don't practice a religion. Did you ever? Yeah, I grew up in a conservative Jewish family in the kosherest of homes. My mother was a cantor, and maybe that had something to do with it. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I avoid religion like a plague. <laughs> My views of uh, modern, conventional, and I know um, you and I both know places that are very unconventional and, and more in tune with the, with the true or mystical nature of, of religion. I don't look to religion in the uh, conventional, modern sense um, for any answers. To me, it has nothing to do with spirituality. Mm -hmm. And what are your spiritual beliefs? Um, well, it's really quite simple. Let me try and make it succinct. That Dave or Angie or whoever is living in a world of which we're living in a world that lives inside of what Dave and Angie really are. So the relative Dave and Angie are living in a world that lives inside of the absolute Dave and Angie, which is simply just our pure conscious awareness. And everything's made of it. It's a concept, right? And the concept can't be really understood without, you know, sort of just going and taking a look. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to connect to for people, I think. Do you use any words to describe it? Would you call it energy? Do you call it the universe? None of those fit for you? The universe is not big enough because the, the universe is in that awareness too. <laughs> Everything is moving through us, Angie. Everything is in us and moving through us. You know, I wouldn't, for my part, it's, it's not a belief, it's an experience. So, um, you know, it's hard for me, and it's more the rule than the exception these days for me. Um, you know, it's a taste I've had many, many times in the past, but in, in, in recent, more recent time, it's, it's much more of a rule for me than the exception, and that's the way I experience life, is that it's moving through me rather than me moving through it. So, you know, at that point, it's, it's really clear as day that everything is connected. So, you know, it's really quite a simple spiritual explanation. Why don't you think everyone knows that? Or feels that, experiences that. Why don't? Mm -hmm. Well, we all seem to be stuck. <laughs> you know, we're stuck in in the uh, in a belief that I am inside this body. You are inside that body, and I, not only am I inside it, I am that body, and you are that body. You know, when you know we're that closed off from everything else. You know, our experience with life, our general experience with life tends to be fear, right? Tends to be separation. And it's easy to see how that happens. Uh, I forget where it was, but somebody was telling me a, a view on that where, you know, you watch a small child in front of a mirror. They do peekaboo at the mirror or something like that. And maybe you ask them, who's that? And they say something like, that's my friend, you know? And then the adult, of course, screws it all up and says, oh, that's not your friend, that's you. <laughs> and pretty soon they believe it, and then um, the, the, the pattern of suffering begins. And, you know, you, when you're an adult and, and have had enough, you know, you've suffered enough or you're clear enough or open enough or have gotten rock bottom enough to surrender to some sort of process to change it. Um, it'll just go on like that. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. For those of you listening, it's it's good to know that, that this is possible here on Earth. It's nice to hear you oh, it's, conveying it's, such peace. It's so much more accessible than people think, I think, because it's always right here at zero distance. We just don't, we just don't see at zero distance. We see everything over there. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not right here. It's over there. And it's just not the, it's just not the truth. Right? It's just our, we just live by our relative experience. And we never seem to be able to get out of it. As long as there's that relative experience, there's always going to be, you know, the, uh, the this and the that pulling on either side of you. 
if you could only make two recommendations to people that are listening to how to access that, what would they be? Pay attention. So develop some sort of a, uh, a practice in paying attention to everything inside your body, what's happening around you and your experience with it. And um, trust. How does one trust when they're in fear? How, how should they go about that? That's a very good question. And in the, in the practical sense, you know, I really don't have an answer. I suppose when you've suffered enough, then, then there's nowhere else to go. Right. I believe largely practices are so important for us, whether that be Aikido or journaling or spending time in nature or yoga or yeah, hiking. Yeah, I mean, um, getting involved in a practice is, is always a good idea. You do have to be very careful not to let the practice become a kind of doctrine in some way. You know, every practice has a pitfall, too. Mm -hmm. So practice, yes, absolutely. Um, let it be your um, special place to go to, your, um, you know, your path of mastery. You know, any lineage or practice can also become a trap. And uh, you want to make sure that you don't get sucked into the, um, to, to that trap, which, um, which can also, you know, begin to post that, you know, you, you get to some sort of a practice of some sort and it looks like everything is just wide open and it's a, you know, it's a path to your freedom, your liberation and, and you know, peace and this and that. And then suddenly you find out that it, um, right ways of doing things are wrong ways of doing things. And, you know, it becomes, uh, it could start to become, you know, build walls rather than break them down if you don't relate to it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so you really need to, you know, get into a practice, you know, like Aikido or whatever, and for sure, but, you know, make sure, you know, if what you're interested in is waking up or living life more truthfully, uh, which is basically the same thing, uh, you know, make sure that it's a, it's an art that points in that direction at least, okay, and doesn't hinder you from that. And, you know, Getting on a some sort of a uh, mindfulness practice like what I was um, explaining before is, is very, very useful. Something ongoing. Like I said, um, trust. Really, in the end, there's only two things you can do about anything. And, uh, you know, as I've sort of have figured out over the years, and that's uh, your best effort and, um, and trust. And, you know, I don't have a good answer to, you know, how do you trust if you live in fear? Um, well, how do you wake up if you live in fear, you know? There's really only two choices, right? Yeah. Faith or fear. Yeah, pre pretty much. Trust and fear. I mean, they're, they're, they're opposites. So, you know, take your pick. You know, just work at it. If you find yourself, you know, um, faltering in that way or whatever, or, um, you know, give yourself a break, note it, and move on. Try again. Right. Right. And, and going back to just what we were talking about practice, my experience has shown me that whatever is happening, however proficient I am, whatever is in front of me, whether I perceive it to be good or bad or difficult, is the perfect thing for me at the perfect time. Mm -hmm. So if you're in that awareness that whatever is in your life is what you need and it's here to help you grow, then it makes the suffering a little easier to swallow, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So since we're talking about practices, I would love to know if you have a daily practice, which I know you do, and if you'd be willing to share that with us. Yeah, well, I mean, I practice Aikido every day, <laughs> you know, five to seven days a week. I'm on the mat with my students. We're working this stuff out. So, um, you know, I'm learning stuff all the time as I go, too. You know, I discover new things. And um, so, yes, I mean, I, I'm always practicing um, both the, the physical and, you know, the I'm always practicing Aikido in the, in the, in the body and mind and spirit sense. I also um, have an ongoing uh, mindfulness practice, I suppose. You know, I, I'm a regular meditator. I also just have, uh, I have this recent uh, habit that I sort of um, gotten attached to where I have this app on my phone that dings throughout the day at um, random times. It's randomized. It's basically just a call to attention for a few minutes, you know, just to... And, just to, and what do you do? Well, I ask myself the question, what are you experiencing this moment being alive? And I just notice, right? 
Nice. It's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm involved right now in this um, course of practice that's part of a research study. That's, you know, one of the exercises that came up, and um, I've been using it a lot lately. I really, I really enjoy it. Through study of Aikido or elsewhere? No, it's or? elsewhere. It's through, mm-hmm. yeah, it's through a, um, I don't know if I call it a group or an organization or a research group that you could learn about at nonsymbolic.org if somebody was interested in looking at it. Okay. And do you know the name of the app? Uh, the one I use is called Insight Timer. And it's free? Uh, there is a free version, but you can't really play with all the doodads. You have to you have to buy the actual app to do it, you know, to to use it more than just um, you know at a very very basic level. It's right. Well, cheap. thank you. It's cheap. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else you do? Um, not regularly. I mean, I've gotten in a habit lately of of. Um, uh, doing more, um, going out of my way a little bit more to, you know, simply um, uh, help people out with things when I could, you know, more random acts of kindness and stuff like that just because it seems to, um, you know, make me feel better about <laughs> about people in general and uh, about life. You know, I'll pick up a, if a hitchhiker doesn't look like a mass murderer, then I'll pick him up probably, or, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, having practiced with you, I know you're you appear to be extremely stern and serious when you're practicing Aikido. But my observation is that you care very deeply about the people that are studying with you and their own development. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's an amazing thing to see. I think that you're talking about the body a little bit. So I think nutrition's pretty important to you, is it not? It is. Um, you know, I try not to eat a lot of crap, obviously. My body responds, you know, people respond to all different kinds of ways of eating. My body seems to respond pretty well to this um, so-called paleo diet, mm-hmm. which currently I'm, I'm not very strict about. I try to stay on it as much as I could. Uh, my body really likes it a lot, it seems. Mm-hmm. Is beer allowed? I can't remember on the paleo diet. <laughs> I don't know, to tell you the truth. My cons- it, is, my, it is in your version. My, well, an occasional one is. I don't actually drink that much. Right, right. Well, sake is probably on the paleo diet more than beer. If it isn't on the paleo diet, I, I broke it on New Year's Day. Right, right. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. Life goes on. Can I ask you about money? Sure. So my normal question around money is, do you make more or less money since you found your purpose? But how do you feel about money in general? Do you feel supported? Do you feel like your life is rich? Um, well, in in money terms, my life is certainly not rich, but I have everything I need and want. Want almost everything I have, so um, I'm not really too concerned about it. Fortunately, my wife makes significantly more money than I do. <laughs> right. I would say I make less money now than I did when, for instance, I was um, I was teaching. I used to be a teacher. Uh huh. Believe it or not, I made more money as a teacher. <laughs> that I make now, but, um, you know, it's, um, I find what I make to be enough, um, usually. I don't really um, feel um, motivated by it, though, in any way. Mm-hmm. I, I do what I do, and, I, and I, let them, I let that sort of take care of itself. I mean, I, you know, I, I pay attention to it because it's a practicality, but I, I, don't, um, I don't sort of, I'm not motivated by the bottom line in any way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The reason I ask this question is I think there are many people that have a purpose and a passion that they know about, but they're afraid to leave their regular salaries. Yep. Yep. It's just fear in a different disguise. Right. So uh, your wife, Deanna, who I've met several times, uh-huh. is, you know, very accepting, very beautiful, very lovely lady. Thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. But I'll ask you this about her and about anyone else around you. Have you ever experienced resistance from your friends or your family about what you do for a living? (sighs) Hmm. Sometimes in subtle ways, but not sort of over, you know, not sort of overtly. I guess when you're talking to a fifth degree black belt, you're careful what you say. Is that true? I, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that. That sort of stuff doesn't project any sort of any of those sort of fears that would prevent somebody from just speaking. 
Mm, do you think that's true? I don't really know to tell you the truth. I think so. I think um, I, I don't think there's any question that you know my students and and others afford me a certain amount of um, I don't know what the word is. I, I would say respect and esteem. Yeah, something like that, I suppose. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice. I, I can't say that, that there's resistance in any form that, that gets in my way. Do you think that's related to the fact that you are so clear on, on what you're here to do and you don't have resistance inside you? Yes, and the fact that I don't mind what, how other people relate to it. Mm-hmm. No, I would say, you know, depending on who they are, I, you know, I have a certain amount of care. I mean, I care how people close to me uh, might relate to me in some way, but I also don't mind either. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, it doesn't affect me in any way. I don't, you know, I'm not going to pay it any mind in any way. Mm-hmm. It's you know, right. what I'm, you know, it's what I'm here to do and I'm going to do it. So. Got it. Yeah. Got it. May I ask you a, a lightning round of yes or no short answer questions? A lightning round. Wow, like that Screen Actors Guild thing? Are you going to ask me like what my favorite dirty word is and all that stuff? Well, I don't usually ask that, but would you like to tell us what's your favorite curse word? <laughs> don't say it. Just spell it, please. We want to keep this a clean show. Well, if I spell it, I'm saying it. Come on. <laughs> well, just tell us what it starts with. We can figure out. What is your favorite curse word, Dave Goldberg? Oh, it has to start with an F. Come on. <laughs> We can pretend we're on the actor's studio. Okay. Right. Do you think passion and purpose are the same things? No. Do you think everybody has a life purpose? Yes. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being high, how important is following your joy in igniting your life purpose? Um, is it okay if I go in the slow lane of this, um, of this lightning round highway? <laughs> well, well, do I have a choice? I guess we're going in the slow lane. Okay. Just a little bit of a slow lane. To me... Joy and purpose are kind of like two parallel rivers. So, I, you know, I don't want to give an answer that necessarily indicates that, you know, to me, they're, they're one and the same. You know, so here we have two parallel rivers. One is joy. One is, um, is purpose. And, you know, occasionally they get connected by what I would call like uh, your calling or, um, you know, inspiration. Um, and then, you know, the rivers can connect and it helps when um, that calling or inspiration is, is really authentic, you know, and by that I mean that, you know, it's coming from a place that is um, somewhat absent of the, um, of, you know, self-referential narrative or something like that. It, it's just, um, it's just there and it's pure and you know it. So, you know, when it's coming from there and it's calling to you and it's highly inspired you're highly inspired. Um, that joy can turn into purpose for sure. So I think what I'm going to do, okay, I'm going to play the safe, Angie. I'm going to just say five. <laughs> and I'm going to let people decide for themselves what part joy plays and if it's being connected to their purpose uh, or not. Okay. Right. Makes sense? It does, uh, but I'd like to ask you a follow-on question about that. Absolutely. When you were deciding, I know we talked about this, when you were deciding that Aikido was going to be a major factor in your life, do you think joy was involved in that? Well, you know, it wasn't yet, actually. It resonated on a different level completely. It resonated on a level of um, meaning in some way, and it was clearly coded in some sort of, um, you know, I think I mentioned it before it was it was coded somewhat spiritually but it was happening physically in this warrior way and it was fascinating to me so you know I had a sense that Aikido was going to be a big part of my life before I even started practicing regularly Um, there was something about it that just um, resonated with me on a, on a, a deep level so I really didn't get into the actual joy joy of the practice until um you know uh quite some time after I had um, found it to be uh, a meaningful thing in my life, fulfilling in some way. I see. Yeah. Did you ever quit your job to follow your purpose? Yes. And do you think everybody needs to quit their job? Well, they they need to make a transition one way or another. You know, if if they're unemployed before they do it, then I suppose they don't have to quit their job. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> astute, astute observation. Um, <laughs> 
But, All right. Um, All right. Well, we'll leave that one at that. Okay. Let me ask you one of my favorite questions. What brings you great, great joy in your life? Okay. I'm going to take it slowly and again, if that's all right. Um, well, you know, Dave, this is the lightning round, <laughs> but I guess you have an exception. <laughs> I drive a Prius. <laughs> I experience joy these days in kind of very tempered ways. You know, when most people think of, especially as you put it, great, great joy, they think of it in very sort of dramatic terms. And that also comes with an opposite often. And I simply don't really experience very often joy that way anymore, or sadness for that matter. The way I experience it is um, more in terms of like, you know, sweetness, delight, wonder, fascination, the magic of something. Uh, being gratified, content. When I'm teaching a children's class and a, ch and a child has like this aha moment or when I watch kids playing or something like that and it's all innocent, you know, that's super delightful to me. And I connect well in that way to innocence. I find beauty in simple things, which is also very delightful. Um, I get a huge hit from being in the flow of something, my Aikido or, or whatever it is just being in a flow throughout the day or in an activity of some sort. To me, um, that has a, a sense of magic to it. You know, I, I experience joy in a form of peace and contentment, but not in, in um, dramatic ways, either positively or negatively. And who knows, that might change, you know, again one day. But that's where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. When you say magic, would you say that that feeling of being in the flow is similar to being in some kind of altered state or it can be for sure uh, for me right now I wouldn't consider it to be altered um, you consider it to be the natural place where yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's more of the um, it's more of the um, rule than the exception these days it's a sense of um, of you know there, there's no separation there's just one thing going on right so there's no I'm in here and there's something else out there that I'm dealing with, and um, there's a, uh, a kind of cooperation between the two. It's far beyond that. It's, um, there's literally only one thing happening when there's a sense of flow, and I really, really like that. Allows you to be very present. Very, very present. Yeah, I mean, they, those go hand in hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I don't think we qualify for the lightning round, but I think it was worth taking the time <laughs> to, to talk about those things. So last question for you. If you unexpectedly amassed a good sized fortune, what would you do differently? I would um, I would live on a very, very large piece of property. That's it. You live on a relatively big piece of property now, but you mean like 100 acres where no one could see you? What, what's the draw? Yeah, the sense of, of spaciousness and, and peace. And um, I would probably also start running my classes from the property, you know, uh, put some sort of a, a facility on it. People that are willing to live in a yurt on your property for a year to study <laughs> with you, huh? Well, I don't know. Did I say anything about yurts? Well, I guess they have to live on the ground. <laughs> tough, you're tough. <laughs> I don't think I'll be signing up for How that. How big is the sum of money that we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever sum you need. <laughs> oh, yeah. Whatever sum when, you need. Well, then, there, there, there'd be all kinds of austere but comfortable um, places to stay for not just uh, them but myself as well. Mm -hmm. Sounds very nice. I look forward to seeing that come to fruition. Do you feel crowded in your life right now? Um, no, but I, I prefer spaciousness. I prefer to be in space. I, I, my preference is not to be among crowds or to be uh, too much of a center of attention or anything like that. That's just, you know, part of my inherent Daveness, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting from a man who stands in front of a dojo teaching up to how many people can fit in their hundred? That would be a pretty big crowd in here. I think the biggest crowd we, we could probably accommodate and still move around effectively for the practice is, you know, 50-something. So, but that's a lot of people for a man who doesn't want to be the center of attention. Yeah, I mean, I feel at home when I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, I wouldn't want to, you know, I'm not sure how comfortable I am with crowds much bigger than that. But, of course, if they're all there for the same reason, it, it changes things for me a little bit. You know, if we're all on the same path, it makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really one to um, 
be a spokesman for um, this sort of work. I operate much better at the at the retail level where where people are walking through the door and um, <laughs> coming to me, and then um, we take it from there. I'm not much for going out of that place and bringing people in. Right. But I know that you, it's a very interesting conversation because I know that you do travel and participate in leading other retreats right. uh, with other Aikido leaders. Yeah, and, yeah, I collaborate a little bit. Yep. Yeah. So, very interesting. Yeah. Would you consider yourself an introvert? Yeah, I would actually. Okay. In, in that sense, I, I suppose I am. But, you know, again, it's just a, a preference of how I prefer to be with my time and energy. It doesn't prevent me from doing anything. Right. Yeah. So tell me, just in closing, what should listeners learn from your life? To pay attention to theirs. (laughs) Was there a time when you didn't pay attention to your own life? Not to the extent that uh, maybe I should have been. I think I, I, especially early on when I was younger, I, I looked more outside of my own experience for answers look to your own experience for um for answers it's your best teacher really but also um at the same time it's it's always good to get involved in some sort of a practice that can offer some guidance and some assistance right Uh, right i love that love that yeah do you have any personal growth recommendations for people that are listening well you know i'm i'm a little biased towards aikido but of course it has to um resonate with a person to it's a selective group I think <laughs> right um, right do you have a favorite book that introduces someone to the practice of Aikido you know I don't to tell you the truth but there are some some classic things out there that um, point in a pretty good direction but the direction that I'm going in um, there's really I don't know of anything that's written from that perspective out there well, right now well We'll have to wait for your book. So get busy. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe one day. My, or, I do, I do know. Your... I do know somebody. Um, one of my Aikido brothers I know has been working on a book for a while. I expect that to be to, to be quite, not quite, but really good. And we'll see when that comes out, if and when he he actually uh, puts it out there. It depends what you want. If all you're really interested in is ask yourself honestly, what is it you want? You know, what do you want, right? If, if all you want to do is get into better shape, then go get in better shape, you know? If all you want to do is learn self-defense, then, you know, go to, you know, a place that teaches a self-defense course. If all you want to do is improve, you know, your sense of relationship or whatever, then, you know, do that, you know? You know, if you're looking for a certain you know, dimensionality, a certain broadness to your sense of growth and evolution, so to speak, that can take you as far as you can imagine, then at least get into some sort of um, uh, mindfulness practice and um, something that points in the direction of freeing yourself from whatever has prevented you, whatever has been preventing you from, from going there. You know, just do it. Get into a practice of some sort. Right, right. And, that, and have some patience. It's going to, you know, it takes time. I mean, it doesn't take time, and it, and it does take time. It takes time in the relative sense in that, you know, you got to push through the, you know, the you know, practices and, and actually do them. Um, and sometimes, it, you know, those practices take time, take effort you know, mess with our, you know, um, sense of um, uh, what we want to be doing instead. You know, sometimes we get distracted from them. You know, you got to have some fortitude. And, you know, in the same time, it doesn't take any time because, you know, in terms of what I was describing, it's right here, right now. It's just, you know, how clouded are, are we in, in relation to it? You know, it's not a matter of adding something. It's of just r- removing the the clouds that uh, that prevent the sun from shining. Mm, the, sun's, mm-hmm. the sun's there. You know. Right. Right. Beautiful. Well, I could continue to talk to you for hours. Very interesting conversation, but I think we need to close for this particular interview. Thanks, Angie. It was great. 
Thank you. And before we end, please tell me how people can get in touch with you if they'd like. Maybe your website? Sure. You can get in touch through my website. My email link is there, too. It's www.aikido, A-I-K-I-D-O-S-D, as in San Diego, dot com. Okay, aikidosd.com. Yep. And do you do, uh, if someone wanted to check out Aikido, are you doing intro classes? Uh, right now we're right in the middle of um, one of our, um, what we call Aikido 101. It's a five-week term, and um, we're doing another one in September. But, um, you know, people can um, come by any time and watch classes and uh, see if uh, it's something that resonates with them. They don't have to get involved um, doing one of those Aikido 101 courses first. It's just, a, it's just another option that some people choose. Right. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Thank you for spending an hour with me today. It's been my pleasure to learn more about you and that everything is right here for all of us. All right. Thanks, Angie. All right. Thank you. All right. This is Angie Swartz, and it's part of my own purpose to be delivering this rich content to you. I thank you so much for spending an hour with us today. I hope your life is enriched. I know that because you're listening to this show that you're on some kind of a growth path and I honor you for that. If there's another way that I can help you, please like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash life purpose advisor or send me a message on my website at lifepurposeadvisor.com. Have a wonderful evening and I'll speak with you soon.